All right. I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. I'm Flynn. With me are Luke Shoemaker and Alice Bosco. We're all from Ambassador Labs. We all work on Emissary. Ooh, we can take our masks off. So yeah, this is what we actually look like. All of us have work, are working at Emissary Ingress. Uh, I've actually been involved with the project since the beginning, back in 2017. Luke has been elbows deep in a lot of the low-level stuff for, I don't know, a few years now, I guess? About three years now. About three years. Alice actually came over and worked on the support side of the world at Ambassador Labs for a while, got a good sense for what the customers need, what the users need, and then decided to join us at Engineering. We have successfully dragged her over to the dark side. We're going to talk quickly about, I'm going to do a quick intro and a recap of some of the stuff that we've, some of the places we've been. Uh, Alice is going to talk about self-service configuration, about why it's important, about how to use it well and how to avoid getting burned. And Luke will then take over to talk about some changes that have been made and are being made to the CRD input language for emissary ingress and about, as you may have heard, the Envoy Gateway. So without further ado, 2021. 2021 was kind of an interesting year for us. We donated Emissary to the CNCF, got a new name in the process. Uh, we did the Emissary 2.0 release, where lots and lots of things changed, for those of you who are used to it from before. We made a lot of changes to the input language, where we retired Get Ambassador.io v0 and v1. We switched fully to v2. We introduced v3 alpha 1. and also enabled it so that the system could automatically convert between v2 and v3 for you to make the upgrade path smoother. Uh, that happens with a piece of the system that's new called API X. And we also found that we were having a fair amount of friction with having Helm manage CRDs for us. So we ended up yanking the CRDs out of Helm and that made things a lot simpler. Emissary can be used on top of other service messages service meshes, excuse me. Uh, we improved our integrations with Linkerd and Console and Istio. A lot of that work was around MTLS. Not all of it, but a lot of it. That's probably the thing that was most visible to folks. We ended up doing 30 releases that year across 2,300 commits. Uh, we ended up with something north of 7,500 users on Slack. Huge thanks to the community. There's no way we could have been here without you. So, for those of you who are less familiar with Emissary, let me do a really quick intro. It's an API gateway, so if you have a Kubernetes cluster with services in it, and you have some users who are not in that cluster, then Emissary's job is to sit in between those two at the edge of the cluster and mediate access from outside the cluster to inside the cluster. This is colloquially the ingress problem. Emissary focuses on the ingress problem because the ingress problem is always the first one that cloud native developers have to wrestle with. In a lot of smaller organizations, or less complex situations, it can be the only problem that a developer needs to deal with here. Emissary is an open source cloud native developer centric self service API gateway powered by Envoy. Uh, it was designed from the beginning to make it easy to get started, to make it easier to take advantage of the power of Envoy without actually having to learn to be an Envoy expert. Uh, at this point, it is a CNCF incubating project. We started in 2017. We've seen pretty widespread adoption since then. We're running in thousands of places right now. Uh, and I want to take your attention back specifically to the part saying developer-centric self-service there. That's the bit that Alice will be talking about in more detail shortly. This turns out to be something that's been really important in terms of adoption is that particular bit of focus. Okay, it is an API gateway. One of the core roles of an API gateway is routing traffic. So if you have a user Jane who wants to request a quote from some service, then she can do that. A user Mark can request a quote. They might not talk to the same service, that might just be something where they're getting charted off for load balancing. It might be something where there are more deliberate things going on. Maybe they're users in different tenants. But this is a core function of an API gateway. It is not the only function. API gateways, in addition to being proxies, are a really good place 
to bring together more centralized functions that you really don't want your developers to have to worry about individually. So for example, application security. Maybe Jane is allowed to update quotes, but Mark is not. And you can centralize that in the API gateway, let it worry about auth for you, and then your developers can just rely on that and not have to worry about it. Other things that are really useful for bringing into this area, there's observability, there's rate limiting, there's a bunch of resilience and development stuff. A lot of these things, and there are a lot more, I'm not gonna go over all of these, a lot of these end up overlapping with service meshes, and that's okay. The API gateway and the service mesh are different roles. You can, if you set things up correctly, you can mix and match these in functions to take care of them at the level that makes sense for your organization or for your use case. I mentioned earlier that Emissary is powered by Envoy, and some of you may be also familiar with Ambassador EdgeStack, which is in turn built on top of Emissary. Um, everything that EdgeStack can do, Emissary can also do, you just end up having to write more code on your end. And with that, I will hand it over to Alice to talk about self-service configuration and why that is an important and useful thing. Thanks. So Emissary Ingress supports self-service configuration. What does that really mean for the end developers? If you take a look here, here's an example of some of the Git Ambassador IO resources that used to configure Emissary Ingress. In particular, note how we've separated them out based on distinct function. So each resource is generally focusing on what you're going to be wanted doing at any given time so that you can focus on exactly what you need to do at any given point. Note that these three resources are only about maybe 10 or so lines each. They can result in an Envoy config that's easily hundreds, if not more, lines long. You can also configure Emissary Ingress using the Ingress resources should you need to. But we think that the best way to do this is using the Git Ambassador IO resources. Note particularly that the Ingress resource, you have to specify the host name you want to use, you're providing your secret name if you're doing TLS termination, and you're specifying the rules for what traffic you want to send into what upstream service. Whereas with the Git Ambassador IO things, you can configure things on an individual level that you might not need to configure more than once or twice. If you want to configure where you're listening for traffic, you can set that up. And once that's configured, then you can focus directly on things like mappings to focus on getting config straight to your services. We've put a lot of time and effort into the design of the Git Ambassador IO resources. That's why we really think this is the best way to be configuring it. We've taken a look at some of the challenges that result from configuring things at a scale with existing resources, such as the ingress, and we're constantly revisiting it to look at what is working for people at a scale, what are points of conflict and friction, and ways that we can upgrade things and make them better in the future. Obviously, we didn't design perfect resources on the first try, but that's why we continually look to improve them and see how we can make them better, as Luke is going to talk about in a little bit. Now, the whole self-service point means that any one developer can do this as they need it and focus on pieces bit by bit. When an auth is particularly relevant to you, you can start creating auth service resources to focus on that. You can do hosts and listening to configure how their traffic is getting into the cluster. And then when you're ready to get it up and sent to your upstream services, you can just focus on the mappings. You get the most benefit out of this, though, when you have that distinct role separation, where you've got your ops and your admin folks who can focus on kind of the cluster level tasks and more maintenance things, getting things set up and prepared so that it's ready for the developers who can just focus on deploying the services that they're developing and figuring out what kind of traffic they want to send to that service. As for the best practices with configuration, obviously you get the most out of it when you're using that separate distinct role approach so that you can trust that your operators are just gonna focus on making sure things are set up for you. Your developers aren't overburdened worrying about how to configure all these different things when they just wanna deploy a service. And then each person can focus on their individual tasks, trusting that the other person is gonna be taking care of that side of the world for them. This really empowers teams to do independent releases without having to necessarily worry about what operations is doing or what the other teams are necessarily doing. They can just think about the services they're developing and how they want to get traffic to those. It also means that you don't have to wait for ops to expose the services you're developing. You can figure out exactly how you want to expose them and do it really quickly with a small amount of config. 
Each team benefits the most when they're trusting each other to take care of their separate roles so that each person can focus on the stuff that's relevant to them. Now, the trust between teams doesn't necessarily have to be blind, and you don't have to give everyone just total access to your cluster. You can use Kubernetes RBAC to set up permissions for who is allowed to use what resources, apply resources, configure, and create things. In particular, we're a big fan of this tool called kubectl sudo that can let you set up permissions for who particularly is allowed to use elevated permissions when working in the cluster and who might necessarily just have only read configurations. So that makes it really easy for everyone to take a look at the config that's in the cluster, but you can limit who's allowed to make changes without limiting who can inspect things, get logs, get information, see what's in the cluster and the status of all these resources. You can also use tools like GitOps and store your infrastructure as code to add additional control points so that you're not necessarily limiting who can make changes to the cluster, but you're putting it behind that barrier of a pull request so that if someone wants to make new config changes, they can pull request it, and then you can have specific reviewers who can approve, deny, make changes before that actually impacts your cluster. Other CD tools here as well can help make sure that you're automatically validating that config before you're pushing it out to your cluster. And now Luke's going to talk a bit about the V3 CRDs and some upcoming changes. So one of the things that we mentioned that we've changed in the last year is that we uh, dropped support for the GetUpMaster.io, V0, and V1 uh, input languages. Uh, now, we had deprecated those and introduced V2 way back in Emissary 1.0 in January 2020. And so only just recently in Emissary 2.0 did we finally drop support for those old versions. Now, even though we you know, two years of lead time, uh, that was a pretty non-disruptive change for us to have that much lead time uh, because the languages had been pretty much evolving uh, additional only of we, because we didn't have any real uh, conversion mechanism to convert between the versions, we could only make additive changes. Uh, well now with V3 Alpha 1, which we also introduced in uh, 2.0, uh, we have a real conversion mechanism, and that's allowing us to make some changes that we've wanted to make for a long time, but couldn't in order to clean up the interface. So uh, the, one of the most obvious uh, is a pretty simple one. There are a lot of things that were snake case before that we're transitioning with camel case to be more consistent internally and more consistent with everything else in Kubernetes. Um, we're, we've got a bunch of fields that were like timeout underscore ms and then an integer number of milliseconds. We're transitioning those to be durations to be, both, again, both internal consistency and consistency with everything else in Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, when we'd have a field that we wanted to deprecate and replace with something else, uh, we'd have both options. And so now we're getting rid of some of those older things. So we used to have this use web sockets, uh, which we replaced <coughs> with allow upgrade, which is uh, more capable and more flexible, but we've been supporting both. And so in V3, uh, we are removing used WebSockets, um, similar deal with hosts, uh, in configuring which host names a map end matches. Uh, there used to be this kind of clunky mechanism with host and host regex. Um, we've, we're consolidating <coughs> these things to make them easier to work with and also adding support for DNS globs. Um, and so being able to make a lot of these cleanup changes is what's been going on in V3. Um, and a, a bigger, you know, those are all pretty small changes. A bigger one is that uh, auth service, log service, rate limit service, tracing service, and mappings all create what we call an Envoy cluster. And that's essentially a thing that Envoy can dial out to, you know, a cluster of IPs or whatever. And there, you know, the basics of this is, you know, give it, give it a set of IPs or give it a host name um, that it can resolve. Uh, but there are a lot of tunables on those, uh, like timeouts and stat settings. And how you do that for each of these services and mappings, um, how you do that's all different. Whether you can even do a specific thing for one is inconsistent between all of them. Uh, and so we're going to be factoring that out, making that consistent, uh, and having parity between all of those for all of those resource types. Um, now, I'd, I'd said, so we're on V1 Alpha 1 right now, or V3 Alpha 1 right now. Uh, we're going to, we're working toward V3 as we're making more of those changes. And so, uh, V3 Beta 1 should be happening soon with most of those. Uh, now, I'll point out that Emissary 3.0 is also coming soon, and Clint's going to talk about that in a bit. Um, those, the progression of the input language and the Emissary version number, they aren't tied together. Uh, 
3.0 is probably happening before uh, input language v3 beta 1 even happens. Um, they, they should both be soon, but the, the 3.0 is probably is actually going to be first. Um, sometime after that, we'll probably have a v3 beta 2 uh, that has those, that cluster configuration consistency. Um, and then sometime after that, we'll say, okay, we're, we're satisfied with all the changes we've made and let's promote to v3 final. Um, now, a note on compatibility. So we've got this cool conversion layer. Um, and about how it works is that uh, there's one version that you're allowed to store into etcd in the API server. And so when you create a v3 alpha 1 resource today, it actually converts it down to v2 to get stored and then converts it back up to v3 alpha 1 for emissary to consume it. Uh, and so because of that, v1 is very central to how things are actually running. And so you can be sure that you know, v2 support's not going to break uh, and that you don't have to worry about that ever breaking. Um, and that's going to keep being the storage version uh, until, at least until v3 final. Um, and, and there are several reasons for that. A big one is to have a smooth upgrade path from MSRA 1.0 because of some bugs there. Um, but uh, you're, it's going to keep doing conversions. You can still, you don't have to worry about any of these changes breaking you. You can still keep using v2 or v3 alpha 1. Um, and uh, then opt in to the newer, cleaner stuff as we come out with it. Um, so we're not going to break anyone. And you know, we are trying to make this cleaner and easier to use. And so feedback would be very welcome about you know, what are some of the friction points that we could improve. Now, uh, related to going forward with new API, with new input languages, uh, on Monday, you might have caught the announcement of this new Envoy Gateway project. Um, so there are, we are one of the two CNCF gateway projects. Uh, there's another one called Contour. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, MSR and Contour are very similar, both functionally and like architecturally. And so we've du been duplicating a ton of effort between these two projects. And so Envoy Gateway is us coming together and saying, let's you know, collaborate instead of duplicating the effort. Uh, and not, it's not just Emissary and Contour folks coming together. There are several other organizations coming in with Envoy Gateway, but you know, those are the two CNCF ones um, that are very visible. Uh, and so you know, does that mean that you would be a sucker to keep investing in Emissary? No. Um, one, you know, we're gonna keep, we're not gonna stop working on Emissary you know, tomorrow and start working on Envoy Gateway. We're gonna be working on both in parallel for a while. Um, and, but you know, what about after that? What's the long-term outlook, outlook on Emissary? Um, well, we're going to be transitioning. The long-term plan is to transition Emissary to be built on top of Envoy Gateway. Uh, there, in you know, I'm involved with both projects, and so I'm going to be making sure that's one of my roles in Envoy Gateway is to be making sure that it's capable of of hosting Emissary. Uh, and there are some, and Emissary's long-term perspective is that there are a lot of things that it does that Envoy Gateway is just not interested in doing. And so uh, Envoy Gateway is supporting. Uh, Gateway API 0.5 and later. Um, 0 0.5 is not out yet, um, but you should turn into tomorrow's uh, Gateway API chat talk uh, to learn more about, hear more about that hopefully. Um, but so uh, Emissary can take that get a master IO language that Alice was talking about earlier. It can take the Knative language. It can take the old Ingress API language. It can take the old older versions of the Gateway API language that Envoy Gateway is just not interested in. And so this allows you to have compatibility between some different systems, it, that's you have migration paths, and so Emissary is still delivering value there, and will continue to deliver that value. Uh, and also, uh, Envoy Gateway itself is in, cons, is it interested in watching resources other than from Kubernetes. If Emissary lets you do this reconfig from other places, uh, namely console, and that will never be part of Envoy Gateway. That's not on its roadmap. And so Emissary, you can think of it, you know, it's going to keep doing these things and hopefully have a, uh, even a better base as we get, as we join forces on engineering for that base instead of duplicating all of this effort. And uh, I'll hand back to Flynn for the recap. So. Alice talked a lot about self-service and about ways you can use that without getting burned, ways that it's been important. We talked a little bit about the nature of the Ingress problem and why Emissary has been focusing there. 
the self-service thing really does turn out to work very well, especially that separation of concerns where you can have developers worrying about applications while other people are worrying about infrastructure. They can support each other, but they don't have to get tied up with each other. It does take a certain amount of trust. It can take some time to establish that trust, but in our experience, it's been worth it to do so and to continue forward. Uh, Luke talked some about the input language changes. I'd like to reiterate that we really do believe that the version 3 stuff is the way to go. We're actively looking for feedback on that one. V2 will still be supported. We think that's important. There, there have been a lot of burned fingers getting us to V3, and the lessons that we learned, that, learned doing that and getting burned doing that are things that we'd like you all to benefit from. Luke also was talking about the Envoy Gateway. The short takeaway from that is really we are involved in the Envoy Gateway because we think it's better for everybody, for us, for y'all, for the rest of the community. We think it's a good thing. The three of us, the people who are not working on Emissary will definitely be involved with Envoy Gateway going forward. You heard a little bit about Emissary 3.0. This is coming soon. Uh, Emissary follows semantic versioning, so the biggest reason that Emissary 3 is Emissary 3 instead of 2 or something else is that there's a massive breaking change underneath in that the Envoy version 2 configuration will no longer be supported in Emissary 3. This includes the transport protocols that Emissary uses to talk to external auth and rate limit services. So Emissary 2 already supports the Envoy v3, it, yes, it is annoying that there are so many twos and threes here. I'm really sorry about that. Emissary 2 already supports the newer transport protocols. There is nothing preventing anybody from going ahead and switching to Envoy v3 right now before 3.0 comes out. Once 3.0 comes out, once Emissary 3.0 comes out, the old v2 transport protocols will not be supported. That's important. There are going to be new features in 3.0. Can't really talk about those yet, sorry. Um, but the biggest driver for calling it 3.0 is that breaking change under the hood. So I'd like everybody to be, to be prepared for that one. Um, kind of restate the obvious here. There's no possible way we would have gotten this far without the community. So thank you very much for that again. If you're interested in getting involved, please be interested in getting involved. Uh, a great way to do that is to just join our Slack channel. All three of us are easily reachable there. I'm also not going to lie. I have to acknowledge 2021 was kind of rough in terms of contributor friction, and we are actively working on making that better right now. So this is how to reach us by email if you want to. We'll be here. We have a booth in the, it's booth S30 in Pavilion 2. Uh, we'll be there at various points. Would love to see you. We have some time for questions, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, we have a few questions. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the Envoy Gateway. And I'm saying it from heart because I'm part of the Contour team. I'm the community manager for Contour. Yeah. <laughs> so good luck with that. Also. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone, questions uh, from the audience over here? If not, there's a question from the virtual attendance. Uh, is there a point uh, where you can integrate with external authorization service? There is. Yes. Uh, so when I was talking about all of the resource types that create clusters, one of them that I mentioned is an auth service. That's exactly what that is. That's configuring a, uh, a service that you want Envoy to go talk to over the XOffC protocol. All right. The and, auth service. And the next one is... Actually, oh, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I was going to... To extend that a little bit, XOffC works by every request that comes into Envoy Envoy turns around and asks the external authentication service, hey, is this okay? And the auth service gets to use really whatever resources it wants to decide whether it's okay, and then come back and either tell Envoy, this is good to go, or come back and say, no, it's not okay, you should respond to the user, respond to this request with a given response. So the auth service actually has an enormous amount of power to do things in that world. It's a very, very flexible setup. Thanks. And um, another one from the virtual. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do a smart uh, rate limiting, like based on um, uh, payload field? Would you, uh, would you like to talk about rate limiting? <laughs> um, so there's, 
you know, there's the rate limit service, which lets you use Envoy's rate limit filter to talk to an external service. Um, you get several pieces of uh, information about the incoming request. Uh, you don't get the full payload. Um, you could do something like that uh, using the XDOF and an off service instead of the, the rate limit proto and uh, a rate limit service. Um, but you kind of wouldn't want to very much <laughs> um, because uh, with the, you want the communications with the rate limit service to be pretty lightweight because that's what you're counting on to stop you from overloading all of the other stuff. And so if you want you know, to say, hey, Envoy, I want you to buffer the whole body to pass it to my rate limit service, that's going to be adding a bunch of overhead that you probably don't want in your rate limit system. Um, and so you can get several pieces of metadata, and hopefully it's enough. And so you know, even if you did want to say, OK, rate limit service for kind of tier one filtering and then more advanced stuff using the body with a, an auth service that's acting like a rate limit service, you could do that. That probably wouldn't be bad, but you probably don't want that level of everything in the first level rate limiting. Thanks. But the, the heavyweight nature of that request is kind of why the rate limit services don't typically include the body, because it can be really expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your presentation. And could you please specify in more details what the relationship between uh, Ambassador Edge Stack and the uh, NSRA Ingress? And I mean, uh, sorry for a straightforward question. Why do I need to buy for? Ambassador H stack. So, without diving too much into a pitch for Ambassador Edge stack, um, from a technical level, Ambassador Edge stack is basically taking emissary and bundling implementations of an authentication service and a rate limit service for you so that you don't have to do that engineering yourself. Uh, the underpinning is all the same. The, the way it handles traffic is the same between the two of them. And if you want to implement your own auth service and such, you're more than free to do that with Emissary. Sorry, and the very quick second question. So if we are just looking for to switch to um, Ambassador Edge Stack, do you prefer us to switch to Envoy Gateway <laughs> after the latest news? Oh. So, so like we said, um, the, the long term, so it's going to be a while before Envoy Gateway is you know, up at parity with being able to do a lot of these things. It's mm -hmm. just starting, it's going to be a while. You know, we, we're not reinventing the wheel, there's a bunch of code from Emissary and from Contour that we're gonna be borrowing in Envoy Gateway. But it's gonna be a while before it's useful. And then even once it is, you know, Emissary is gonna still exist, still be built on it, still have some added value that you wouldn't get from Envoy Gateway. Okay, thank you. And if you stop by the booth, we're happy to talk more about that, too. Any more questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. And I wonder whether you support the um, equivalent uh, functionality, such as the web application firewall protection for injection attack or uh, yeah, like cross-site scripting, SQL injection. Um, if it's not a support uh, out of the box, then whether there is uh, some extension point that could introduce those functionality into the system. So, so Emissary doesn't really, s Emissary focuses on more on the English problem than on that particular kind of security issue. Um, we've seen people have really good success with using Emissary in combination with other products. Um, and we have also seen people approaching that using WASM stuff in Envoy, which I could see supporting in Emissary as well. Um, I got to be honest, I'm not sure how well that approach is working for them yet, but we've seen people go after it that way. The most effective way right this second is probably partnering. What were you going to say? Uh, yeah, so there's no none of that built into uh, Emissary. Um, I do want to say that like with Edge Stack, some of the stuff that it does, does its own cross-site request forgery protection mm -hmm. for like the things that it does, but it's not doing it for your application. Um, but we do have the extension points for it to integrate. I, I, there are WAFs I know of that 
use the XDOF uh, integration point to be able to see the requests coming in, mm -hmm. and then also use the, lo uh, the access log service to have the view of requests to be able to notice suspicious patterns. Um, and that's actually specifically why we added the log service in order to facilitate that WAF extension point use case. Thanks. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, folks. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.